All right, welcome back. We'll continue now with looking at a specific boundary value problem, and we look at one for fluids, okay? It's not going to be a tremendously complicated boundary value problem because we want something that we can um, get, uh, that, that we can solve analytically, right? Right here. Okay, so let's consider now um, the following, right? Let's consider the flow. Of a um, of an incompressible viscous fluid okay and let's make it um, easy for ourselves by saying that we're going to look at this at steady state. Okay? All right. So this is the sort of configuration we are interested in looking at. So I'm going to say that this is uh, E1, E2, E3. Okay? And we are interested in looking at a situation where we have a uh, flow that is uh, in a... Uh, circular cylindrical pipe, right? So, um, let me see if I can draw this reasonably. Um, right, so this is, this is a pipe along the uh, E3 direction, right? And um, we have that. Okay, so, right, at this end we have uh, x3 equals 0, sorry, the x3 coordinate equals 0, okay, and here we have uh, x3 equals L, right? Furthermore, let's suppose that this uh, circular cross-section has radius A, all right? Now, what I'm going to do uh, is spend just a little time laying out um, some boundary conditions, okay? Let's suppose that at this end, x3 equals 0. So, so uh, x3 equals 0 represents one subset of our pressure boundary. Okay, maybe we call this uh, partial omega T P1, right? And this is partial omega T P2, okay? At this end, we have also, uh, let's suppose we have P equals uh, P0, and at this end, we have P equals P sub L, okay? Just different pressures at, at different ends of the pipe, at the two ends of the pipe. Now, what we are going to say is that the rest of the boundary, which is essentially the lateral boundary, right? The cylindrical boundaries of the pipe, right? Conveniently, this looks more or less like a pipe, right? So what I've said so far is that imagine that, that this, this end were open and so were this end. So let's suppose that this end was, uh, was uh, x3 equals 0, okay? So, uh, right. 
right? So, so we have x3 equals 0. So, so this is the, the E3 direction. So at this end, we have P, P0. At the other end, we have PL for the pressure. And now on the lateral boundary, right? Uh, the lateral boundary makes up uh, for us our velocity boundary, OK? So our velocity boundary now is uh, partial omega T V. Right, it is all of this stuff. Okay. All right now, on the partial on, on on that velocity boundary, we want to impose a no slip condition. Okay. Now that boundary you observe is the boundary x one square plus x two square equals a square. Right. On this boundary, we want to say that our velocity v equals 0. Okay, all components of the velocity vanish there. Okay, so that's a no slip condition. Okay, so let, let me maybe I should, okay, so I'll, I'll call this the no slip condition. Okay, and this is just the inlet pressure. And that is the outlet pressure. Okay, that is what we need in terms of boundary conditions. And um, what about initial conditions? Do we need any? Right, steady state. Right, so no time dependence here. So we're assuming that we have steady flow. So our partial of uh, partial with respect to time of v is zero. Okay, so steady state. Okay, implies or means really that our partial time derivative of the velocity vanishes. Okay, so as you can see, we are making life a little easy for ourselves. Okay, let's see, what else now? Um, okay, so we are, we've said now that we have an incompressible and viscous fluid, okay? So what that means is, um, we know that means something for our stress constitutive relation. Okay, what this implies then is that our Cauchy stress is P, right? plus a uh, viscous stress that depends upon D, all right? Okay, I'm going to add on something here. I'm going to say that we have a um, Newtonian fluid, okay? As you can see, I'm making it progressively easier for ourselves. Okay, let's also assume uh, Okay, also assume that the fluid is Newtonian, all right? And what this implies then is that sigma v, function of the rate of deformation tensor, is just 2 mu d. Right, where mu now is the viscosity, okay? So, finally, we have for our stress, sigma equals P isotropic tensor plus 2 mu D. 
okay? That is the constitutive relation we are working with. All right, let's now um, get into the equations because I think we've done everything we, we really need to here, okay? All right, so let's see now. What else can we say about the equations, right? So, so the equations, the PDEs that we have, right, in their full form are the following. For mass balance, we have this. And for the balance of linear momentum, we have, let me write out everything and then I'll drop stuff, okay? But let me just write out everything and say what we've lost here, sorry. Okay, all of that is our Material time derivative of the velocity equals divergence of uh, P isotropic tensor plus 2 mu D, okay, plus BF, okay? Let's, let's say that there's no body force, right? The gravity and things like that don't really play a role here. Okay, let's forget about that. All right, we already know about incompressibility, and so, so let's see what effect that has. By the way, I, I've been forgetting to state this, though I've remembered that I need to say it. This pair of equations constitutes a subset of what are called the Navier-Stokes equations for fluids, right? And they're some of the most famous equations in, in physics, right? So these are the Navier-Stokes equations. So I better state that here because I've remembered today to say it. Okay, so the Navier-Stokes equations properly also include an energy equation, but that is often um, not included because certain assumptions are made on, on, on heat conduction or temperature and so on. Okay, so essentially here we're assuming that everything is at a uniform temperature, all right? So heat flow does not really matter to us here. Okay, so, all right, so, so these are the equations of Navier-Stokes and now let's apply incompressibility, okay? So incompressibility Okay, what does it imply for us? When, when we said that, that the Cauchy stress has this dependence with the pressure, uh, I took care not to say that the pressure was a function of the, the mass density, right? Simply because we, we were saying, well, we know that if, if we have incompressibility, the mass density is, is, is fixed, okay? So we can't have the pressure be a function of it. Okay, so in, incompressibility then says that the material derivative of uh, the spatial mass density, which is uh, this quantity, Right, this is equal to zero, right? And we know that this is because um, we know that this derivative is also obtained from that, right? right? The, the fluid is incompressible, so the mass density is always equal to the to the, to the reference mass density, and that remains fixed with time, right? So that, that's what incompressibility gives us. So we, ha we have this equal to zero. What this implies then is that we've lost those two terms from the, from the mass balance equation, okay? And so we see the form of the incompressibility condition that is most commonly used in, fl in fluid mechanics, and it is obtained just as a consequence of this, uh, of, of the mass density remaining constant, okay? And that's this condition is that the divergence of the velocity is equal to zero, okay? All right, 
So we have this. Now, continuing in the spirit of making life easy for ourselves, let us suppose that we are interested in uh, a uh, velocity field where as the flow is going through this uh, cylindrical pipe, uh, the flow is essentially always along the E3 direction, all right? So we are saying that there is no flow in the, in, in the one and two directions, okay? Okay, so uh, also consider the following, right? That V1 and V2 are equal to zero, okay? Now, when we do this sort of thing where we are perhaps for the first time in here uh, also saying something special special about the field which is not like a fundamental physical condition like incompressibility. Okay, we're saying something more. We're saying, well, let's just look at particular cases of, you know, uh, of, of how the field behaves. This sort of an approach is what is called the semi-inverse method. The fully inverse method is one in which we would specify the field entirely, right, and then determine conditions such as, um, you know, do we need incompressibility? Do we need, uh, what are the boundary conditions we need in order to get this particular field, right, where you assume the solution a priori, and then you try and find the other conditions which would give you those, con which would give you that field. That is called the fully inverse method, and that, in fact, defines what, the entire field of study of inverse problems. What we are doing here is not quite the whole hog uh, inverse method, but we are saying, okay, let's, let's sort of partly restrict the field, okay, and then determine the conditions that are needed to give us uh, that particular sort of restriction of the field. Therefore, we call it a semi-inverse method. All right, uh, we have this. Okay, so, so what this implies then is that when we apply it to the, to the divergence condition, right, uh, we know that the divergence condition, which is V i comma i equals zero. But now, since we, have, we are already saying that V1 and V2 are zero everywhere in the field, this implies that V3 comma three equals zero, right? And this is helpful because it tells us that V3 is a function let me call this chi, right? Function of x1 and x2 only, right? Okay, it's independent of the x3 coordinate. Okay, so already we're getting somewhere. 